All right, Wesley's here and Sean is here. This movie came out in 1979. I said this to Sean yesterday, Wesley. If I could just, if all that mattered to me was going to movies mm -hmm. and I could pick basically any three years just to be alive, to just go live in New York City and go to movies when they opened up, mm -hmm. I think I would pick New York City from 77, 78, 79. Yeah. And I would just go to movies. And this is like the classic. You have your mind blown at least once a month. We have have you, a, do you have a list going? The list is quite staggering of yeah. movies released this year. In 79. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the Hall of Fame years, right? It's a pretty crazy one. Do you want to you look that up? I'm just looking it? at a list that I just found on the internet in one second. Give it to us. Apocalypse <laughs> Now. I've heard of All it. All That Jazz. Manhattan. Alien. Life of Brian. Kramer versus Kramer. The Warriors. <laughs> being There. The Jerk. Rocky Two, Breaking Away, Mad Max, North Dallas 40, The Wanderers, Over the Edge, The Amityville Horror. I'm sure yeah. I've missed a bunch. I mean, special time. Lights it's, out. It's a great, it's a great year. And Pacino, one of the most important actors of the 70s, in the running for one of the most important actors of the last 50 years. Yeah, for sure. And this movie just lets him cook. It gives him an apron. It gives him some tools and a knife and some food. It went to one of the fancier grocery stores, bought him some food, <laughs> and just says, Al, just can you cook for two hours? You don't know where this movie is going. Mm. That is its power, and it's, it's genius in some way. You don't know, because, you know, it starts off really light, you know? Like, it's got that pretty bad elevator jazz score um it prefigures the 80s in that way Definitely. you know you can feel the 80s about to happen mm. um yeah it feels like a goofy comedy which i think for most part it is but then it's not it's funny the last time we did the show together we did blowout and that was a 1980 movie that felt like the 70s mm -hmm. and this is a 79 mm -hmm. movie that kind of feels like an 80s movie yeah mm. yeah um I just, you know, I saw, you know, I watched the opening credits and you see that Valerie Curtin and Barry Levinson wrote the screenplay and that Norman Jewison directed it. Usually a couple good signs there. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I just, you know, I was nervous. There's a lot of things. This He's emotional. I can't even speak. I really, I just can't believe how good this movie is. <laughs> It's a total bridge, right? Yeah. It's a major bridge movie from the old 70s Pacino to what he ultimately becomes. And I think kind of how we think of him now yeah. as the explosive, unpredictable, not learning his lines, but still taking over the screen kind of actor. Because in the 70s, it's much more internal. Mm -hmm. It's much more tortured. Mm -hmm. Guy from The Godfather, guy from Scarecrow, Serpico, all these movies. And then when you go into the 80s, you know... I don't well, want to see he, he loses stage for a few years and then yeah, but he I mean this is only his eighth movie, like he had not yeah. made a lot of movies to this point, mm -hmm. but it feels like he looks he looks like he's thirty going on fifty in this movie. He's how old is he in it? He's got to be in his early thirties, probably. He's, he looks older than I do right now. Um, Seventy two to eighty, Serpico, Godfather, Godfather Two, Dog Day Afternoon, Bobby Deerfield, and Justice for All. Close with cru cruising, which. You and I did uh, a few months ago, but what yeah. a seventies that guy! Yeah, wild. Yeah, those were his first like that like through cruising. Those are his first eight movies. There's yeah. no stinker. There's no like, oh man, why did he do that one? Bobby Deerfield needs a little bit more examination, in yeah. a good way or a bad way. I in did, a good way. It's it's a really forgotten a time. Yeah. Like this movie's a little forgotten a time relative to The Godfather and Serpico, but that one I feel like is not nearly as seen. And is also he's very he's very quiet in that movie. It's a strange it's quiet movie and cruising. too. Cruising is probably the worst in that of those eight movies, right? Yeah, but we also know that it's it's also extremely rich. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, yeah. it's giving you so much. It's giving you more than Serpico is giving. Serpico yeah. is a good movie. Jewison said about Pacino, "It's an unusual role for Al in past films like Dog Day Afternoon and even Serpico. He's been the eccentric, cut off from a sane world." This time he's the most rational person in the picture. It's everyone around him in his environment, which is bizarre. I thought that was a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I think that's fair. I think what he chooses to do with his own sanity makes him a bit insane, I think. Well, it's like everybody else drives him insane. But yeah. the, this is the genius of the movie. I mean, should we just talk? Like, what do we do? Like, should we just talk about where this thing winds up? 
because I just sort of feel like the thing that had me crying at the end of this movie was maybe it was just the moment we are living in right now where you can have a person screaming the actual truth <laughs> and the system just closes in and says, nope, get the fuck out. You got to go. We got to expunge you and your radical, mentally unstable honesty. Your awareness that the system is as cracked as it is. It cannot stand in this system. It's got to go. And they basically excrete him. Mm -hmm. Like he is outside the actual hall of justice by the end of this movie for telling the truth. I worry with movies and life in general that everything is so literal now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of social media and just people are like, here are my feelings. I feel this way. I feel that way. That we have less and less movies like this movie that's like, you think this is about this, but it's it's really about this. And that's like all the great stuff that we love, whether it's movies or there's TV shows that still do it. This movie wants you to think it's going a certain way and then it it veers into a hard and then it ends with him breaking the fourth wall, just staring at the camera. And I just don't think anyone would make this movie anymore. It uh, has no nothing in common with anything that happens now. It, it would, it's uncommon for a star part to end so hopelessly. I would say, in like a mainstream True. movie that audiences would go see. Like right. it would be unusual. And this for movie a big was a movie. hit. Yeah. This movie was a hit. For a big movie to end with the note on, that this movie has. But I, th I mean, it's all, it's clearly by design, right? It's like we're at the end of a very tumultuous decade where, mm -hmm. not unlike what you're describing right now, it felt like a lot of people were just saying wild, made up shit throughout yeah. our culture and that those people were kind of edging to the, to the forefront of society. And then that is kind of what happens in the 80s. It's just like charlatans kind of running the country. And that this is like the last honest man, you know, like that concept is who Pacino's character is meant to be. But I also think that the difference between 1979 and eight when this movie was, was shot and now is that I think the country still believed in some way in systems, right? Like, you know, our systems still thankfully work, you know, democratically. But we also know we just don't have the, you know, we're we're split in half about whether they're even real at this point. Right. Um, and I think that the I think an audience watching this movie back then is really struck by. The system's failure to. Work for itself. Right. And all the people that it's working against in this movie. Um, this is another one of those movies. I mean, all the movies for courtroom month have essentially are about they they involve black people in some way, right? Black people are somewhere involved in the legal system as, you know, if we're being real about it, they should be, given the way the country works. Um, in the depiction of it, by the way, that's what I mean. Yeah. Um and the the idea here that every single person we meet in this movie has a corruption, right? Or has corrupt, corruption forced upon them. And, you know, all the people that sort of come before the court are done wrong in some way. Or they're either failed by the lawyers or the system or the system because of the lawyers is really devastating because you can see the there is a procedure. And mm -hmm. if you follow it, in theory, everything should be fine. But they're corrupt judges. There are bad lawyers. There are strange rules. And if you don't follow them and a judge wants to uphold them, can screw a person for life. Right. Um, prison as a place where you go and just never come out. Yeah. You know, the hell of prison. Um, and it isn't even a prison movie, but yeah. understands what happens when you slip out of that part of the system into this other part of the system. Well, I almost wonder, is this a legal movie? Is it a courtroom movie? Or is it really part of this whole 70s thing that was going on with these different conspiracy movies and system is broken movies yeah. and corruption? So like Parallax View, um, that was what it was called, right? Yeah. Yeah. Parallax yeah. View. I'm blanking for a second. Yeah. Um, Iger Sanction, mm -hmm. um, All the President's Men. Then you get into like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, exactly. which I watched mm -hmm. recently, mm -hmm. which is definitely about yep. more yep. than what you yep. think yep. it's about. Three Days of the Condor. Uh, yeah. yeah, Three Days of the Condor. Just that whole kind of Capricorn One. Yeah. Bizarre mm -hmm. movie. Yep. I mean, weirdly but, networked China Syndrome. Yeah, totally. Right. 
where it's like them trying to tell us through fun movies that the evil is out there. Don't trust you people can't in power. Them. Yeah, don't, don't trust, trust anyone. Yeah. They're going to fuck you. Yeah, don't trust people in power. And that's an interesting question, though, because I feel like the movie is iconic for one very specific reason, which is like the misquote that everyone remembers from the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, the you're out of order, you're out of order. This whole courtroom is out of order. Yeah. Which is not actually what he says. But because of that, we think of it as like a prime example of a courtroom movie. And there is 20, 25 minutes that takes place in a courtroom. The main case is hardly even argued. Yeah. But it is a movie that is very about the courts itself and like the way that the courts are built and designed and then who suffers because of the way that the courts are designed. And it's like a, it's like you said, it's more of a system movie than it is a lawyer movie, even though it features lawyers kind of arguing for their own case for life throughout also the entire movie. Set in Baltimore. Mm hmm. And there's this weird connection with The Wire, even though The Wire is. Mm. 20, I hadn't thought of that. 20 plus years later. I. But yeah. The, same thing, right? Systems broken. We have no hope. I actually have been thinking about if we're trying to evaluate the possibility of getting something, getting another work of like screen culture that works is that does all the work that this movie is doing in in two hours. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, David Simon happening. is it's probably a TV the show though. Person. Right, 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 right. Yeah, it's not a movie. Um, I feel like David Simon is the person who's probably doing. Um, I think this is there's like a weird connection between this movie and cruising, you know, his comfort with this with this, you know, transgender person who comes before the court for burglary. But really, that person's crime is actually just being outside of the right. conventional just being way we're thinking yeah. about gender. This is a black person um, who's forced to, like, remove remove their wig and to you know, constantly be humiliated by the system for being, you know, two problems within it, right? Yeah. Like black and, you know, differently gendered. Um, the whole movie's emotional arc hinges on Aggie. The opening scene yep, yep, is yep. the, you know, take off your wig, entering the, the prison, and then that's where we meet Pacino's character. And we see them as these two figures of like two helpless people. He basically. goes out and Aggie comes in, yep. right, of the prison. Of the jail. Well, the piss going under his legs yes, mm. yes, is yes. one of the best, like, two-second, <laughs> like, prison is really awful. Yeah. Here's a two-second snippet, and the way he just kind of moves his legs, but he doesn't stand up is really interesting, but... It's weird, because the beginning of the movie is, su is really harrowing, and then for about 40 minutes, it's kind of like an episode of Taxi, mm -hmm. right. you know? Like, it's freewheeling, it's pretty funny, it's got that weird, funky jazz score that you're talking about. All the characters. Jack are, Warden's a maniac. Jack Warden's do, you know, shooting guns off in the. Jeffrey in, yeah. Tambor. Tambor is yeah. like, hamming it up, you know, big time in these comic set pieces. And then the movie, again, like completely shifts gears. And it becomes this, it becomes a romantic drama. And it becomes a corruption drama at the right. same time. It's a really frank, weird Frankenstein of a movie. And it, but it pulls it all. It never feels like Norman Jewison does not have control over mm -hmm. what the movie is because the screenplay is so good. Right. Mm. And I don't I've never I've not read the script, but it just seems like there's all of this room for a director to let the characters do things. And it's kind of a pot boiler that you don't realize is on the pot and yeah. even boiling. Because by the time the Jeffrey Tambor. So basically, one thing to say about this is there are, there are. All of the lawyers at some point that we meet have a moment. Either they are going to have a moment or they have had a moment in their past that where they're, they, they made a mistake, right? Mm. Either they made a bad choice knowingly um, for their client or to get out of trouble or they represented somebody who turned out to be guilty. And the ways in which these people are haunted by their mistakes or bad judgment is really what this movie is also about, right? There's the way in which the legal system is failing people who come before it, but there's also the ways in which these human beings are sort of done in by their humanity. Mm -hmm. But the judges, all the judges are sort of anti-human, dehumanized, You know, I was monstrous. gonna ask you about this, because this is the fourth movie we've done, and three of the judges in the four movies were 
kind of either awful or kind of came around to be okay, but it seems to be in general. I don't know if it's a movie trope. Is Alfre Woodard, what's her? No, she's not. Oh, she's so I not. guess two of them. I'm yeah. thinking of a couple others that we have coming, but right. for the most part, like the, the, the kind of judge who might not stand for the right things. Like one of the characters is Judge Noose. Yeah. Judge Noose in a time to in kill. In a time yeah. to kill. Um, not so subtle. Like they're not trying yeah. to hide that one, but right. um, I don't know whether he they just Judge don't know. Judge Noose. Is it uh, um, Patrick? Patrick McGowan. Patrick McGowan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's great. Yeah, I don't know what they're trying to say about judges. Maybe it's just a way to make them interesting. Well, I mean, but in this one, J Jack Warden has a—he's you know, carrying a gun. He's sitting on the sitting on a ledge. He's putting a gun in his mouth before. Who's more powerful than a judge? Absolute power no. corrupts absolutely. You know, like that's—I think that's the idea, right? Because in a courtroom, you're the, the, the judge is the king. The right. judge decides. Yeah. The yeah. judge makes every decision when it's posed to them by the lawyer. And so, obviously, when you acquire, when you accumulate that much power in those situations. Ego, vanity, like I mean, in this movie in particular, the judges are pretty cracked. They're they're but this disturbed. Is also, 1979, right? Yeah. This is, I mean, if you if if we're inclined to think of this as as like post Watergate movie, which I mean, it's literally after Watergate. There is a way in which you know we have gotten very comfortable thinking about. I mean, we would have as a country gotten very comfortable thinking about the idea that the presidency is is corrupt in some ways, right? That the highest office in the land, you know, has is rife with snakes in a way that was more blatant and clear. And then Gerald Ford, who would have been president at the, at the time, you know, essentially pardoning Nixon. Yeah. Um, you know, we would have been basically sitting in that piss. I think it's Carter right now, so yeah. Well, Carter, oh, right, sorry. Yeah. It's, it's Carter. Carter. Yeah. Right, sorry. We're in 79. I'm thinking that Carter. No, Carter but the shadow of Ford is still yeah, there. Though. Right. Um, so Nixon's been pardoned. The country's kind of. Well, it's not Carter, like, the, it's we're, not like we're, people have a ton of confidence in Carter. Yeah, it's it's Carter. Yeah. A disaster. Well, but Carter, the thing about Carter that's really fascinating relative to this, to this movie is Carter was telling the truth. Right. Yeah. Carter was essentially leveling with the American people almost at all times. And part of his not being reelected was. Was the American Malay speech? Yeah, people just didn't want to hear the truth. Was yeah. this seventy? Was that seventy nine too? That speech? It was heading toward the election, but yeah, seventy nine yeah. is. But he'd already when things, set the things table are falling apart. For, the oil, the oil is for just him being capable of giving that. Speech, yeah, the crisis right? of confidence speech, July fifteenth, nineteen seventy nine. Yeah. What, what day is this movie is released? It plays Toronto, September fifteenth, nineteen seventy nine. Yeah, I mean, I think that we we'd been living with this man long enough to know that. <laughs> He was he was leveling with us, and I'm not sure we liked it. But also, he couldn't save America from what it felt like it needed to be saved. Right, from. cronyism and everything post Nixon and yep. all that other. He didn't he didn't fix it. Right, no. it's like how it was, I feel about Joe Missoula. Um, <laughs> who's your Ronald Reagan then? That's really the question. <laughs> He's leveling with us that, that we needed a change, but I'm not trying. How do we him. get Coach Spo to Boston? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's that's Reagan for you. Can I give you the best screenplays that year? Yes. This was nominated, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as was the China Syndrome, Manhattan, and all that jazz, and they all lost to Breaking Away. <laughs> mm. It's a good screenplay, though. I'm not going to lie. This is a, Breaking Away is a good, good category. Yeah, Breaking I'm not against good, it. I, Breaking Away is a good screenplay. I don't know. The redo, I'm not but sure that's wins. that's wild. But. And then Best Actor that year. This is a good one. This is an amazing one. Yeah. Pacino, Lemon for China Syndrome, Roy Shatter and all that jazz, who probably wins eight of 10 years normally, right? Mm -hmm. Except Peter you know. Sellers being there and then Hoffman wins for Kramer versus Kramer. And there's an incredible casting what if that I'm just going to do now. Uh -oh. Where Pacino was supposed to be in Kramer versus Kramer. First choice. And yeah. bowed out to do this movie instead. I'd say it's the right call. And everybody wins. Well, I don't think Hoffman would have been as good as Pacino, but I wonder if Pacino would have been as good as Hoffman in Kramer versus Kramer. I think he might have. That's a great question. So you're basically saying Pacino is a better actor. I do than think Dustin. he's a better actor. I think, I he, think has he is too. more range. I don't think Hoffman would have been as good as Injustice for All. I think he would have tried to dial it up. I think that I don't want to. How do I put this? I think there's a kind of. I think Hoffman would have wanted to have have it have had it figured out before 
he got to the set in a way. Mm-hmm. I don't think Pacino knew what was going to happen. Feels like he's reacting. When the camera starts. Yeah. Right? And what's funny to me is all the times in this movie, I kept thinking about what it must be like to be Al Pacino at this point, where everybody knows. I'm trying to think of a sports analogy here that, that, that will really work, but you guys can give it to me. Joe Missoula? Um, no, not Joe Missoula. Um, it's imagine, Patrick Mahomes heading into this season. It's, it's ah. because everybody. We know you're the best. Right. You're not even 30, but you're the best. And watching all these people try to go to town on Senator him. Rogers. Right. Just, just stop. <laughs> just stop. You guys, just, that's a separate podcast. We have, we have nine months of, <laughs> of NFL season to deal I with. I need to talk to you about that, by the way. Um, but just, ominous. <laughs> just imagine, like, just watching these people, like Craig T. Nelson. Yeah, first yeah. movie. I mean, clearly, because he's coming in explosive. He's trying like, to go toe to toe. Yeah. And Pacino is just like, okay. You, you Three years later, it? he's benching Georgievich. <laughs> All the right moves. of vampire pie. Um, but I just, it's just really fascinating to watch Pacino watch all these other actors try to make a statement against him. I almost every one of his co-stars in this movie is going up a level from where they usually are. Yeah. Yeah. Tambor yeah. going up a level. I mentioned Larry Brigman, Larry who is Brigman. a soap opera actor, but yep. he has this great confrontation with him in the car and he's mm-hmm. trying to go up a level, mm-hmm. get a little noisier. Dominic Cheney is trying to go up a level. Mm-hmm. Even his mentor is trying to go up a level by going down a level. Lee Strasberg. Only Christine Lottie. She's the only one who she, like actually keeps it, keeps it cool, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it makes me like her more, even though that is one of the more ridiculous lawyers I've ever seen in a movie. F- f- odd character. Strange. Yeah. Was she? Character. I don't even totally understand what her job was. She was like ethics of some she, committee. She's but on this. She immediately starts sleep, sleeping with Pacino. <laughs> Which <laughs> is like, what's going on? Yeah, the, the continuing indictment of the corruption, yeah. right? Right. But I mean, it's also those that cor- that that corruption committee that he appears before at the beginning of the movie seems like a joke. Right. I mean, it is it's played for a joke. Yeah. And it's the kind of thing that if you. I don't know where Valerie Curtin and Barry Levinson came up with the screenplay, but it definitely seems like they watched some Patty Chayefsky movies and were like, you know what we don't like about Chayefsky? He cannot keep his opinion about the state of things to yeah. himself. Yeah. He does not trust his his sense of of dramatic screenwriting or a sense of satire to tell an audience, this is how I feel. So instead, he literally has people speaking editorials to the yeah. camera in these movies or do, doing voiceover or something. Sounds like Sorkin. What if we, well. One of his, one of his biggest inspirations, Chayefsky. Yes, yeah. 100%. What if we just removed the ne- like the op-ed framework from yeah. our movie and basically did Pat A. Chayefsky like a satire that has a capacity for tragedy and just left it at that. We get good actors in it and we let them do their thing. What would happen? And we got a director who doesn't need to prove anything. Right, right, right. right? Who's just comfortable with people behaving and leaving it at that. Can I give you a couple more 1979 movies? Sure. That Sean didn't mention? Fish That Saved Pittsburgh. <laughs> Stefan on the Level is the other, other ones. Yeah. Fast Break. Yeah. It's all that, all that jazz and justice for all. Fish That Saved Pittsburgh. Fast Break. And then after that is The Young and Field. I like oh, The Young and Field. Okay. Same time next year. Is that Marsha Mason? No. Yeah, the Alan Alda. The, where they, the Neil Simon play. Okay, yeah. That's the one where they meet up once a year and they have the, for their affair, right? Yeah. yeah. I've seen that movie. It's all right. It's a great premise. Good idea. Yeah. It's a great. I think in 2023, it would cause a tsunami online. The Rose. I like The uh-huh. Rose. The Champ. Yeah. R.I.P. Champ. Fred starting Rose. Over. Champ. Underrated Boston movie. Oh, yeah. starting over. Yeah. Norma Ray. Yeah. Oh, Norma Ray. Butch, and, Butch Nor- and Sundance, the early years. Oh, boy. Uh, we had Sun- Norma Ray is in this conversation, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's Nominated one of these Oscars. Movies. Yeah. It's one of these. It's one of these. And Justice for All. What about Meatballs? Meatballs. And <laughs> did you mention Moonraker? No, I like Moonraker. And then we didn't mention a, a huge one that would never get made about 10. Oh, 10. 10 yeah. was that a phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. I did not. There's know. more. Black Stallion was that yeah. year. 79 was amazing. Muppet movie. Muppet movie. Oh, huge. Star Trek, the motion picture. Rocky. Is there a Rocky, Rocky movie? Rocky 2, yeah. 
We already had the uh, Jack Warden segment on a previous podcast. Which was the verdict? That? Yeah, the verdict. Yeah. But just to give his 75 to 82 again, shampoo, all the president's men, heaven can wait, the champ, and justice for all being there, used cars, and the verdict. Jesus Christ. He's just ripping Is them off. Is that two Oscar nominations? Yeah. In that, in that run? Heaven can wait and shampoo. Okay. He is a first-team All-NBA person of, oh, there's Jack Warden. Yeah. It's good to see him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. he's in a movie. It's like, oh, good. Jack Warden's in this. The Robert Ori of American movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really? uh, yes. You always win when he's on your team. Um, we also have John Forsyth as the evil judge. Wow. He's the voice of Charlie's Angels, so we don't know what he looks Is like. It, what year does Charlie's Angels end? Is uh, it over by now? Is, yeah. We have to go through the Shelley Hack year and the Tiny Roberts year. Was Charlie still <laughs> put, Do you want to do a still... Charlie's Angels sidebar? Yeah, he's okay. on the whole time. Okay. Hmm. Hello, Angels. <laughs> Hi, I have Charlie. a good one for you. <laughs> we got to go to Las Vegas this week. Somebody's bumping off showgirls. I always thought it'd be funny if in one of the Mission Impossible movies, they just got John Forsythe to do the, <laughs> just be- Ethan Hunt, it's Charlie. Hey. hey, this is your mission if you choose to accept it. <laughs> Here's Bosley. Um, Forsythe is so compelling in this movie and such a good villain. It makes no sense to me because I knew him as the voice of Charlie and then Dynasty, which was the biggest show of the 80s for Mm -hmm. like four years. Mm -hmm. And he's the kind of patriarch of the Mm -hmm. Dynasty family. And Robert Carrington. Yeah, I think that was his name. Definitely. Blake Blake Blake, Carrington. Blake. How can I forget? Blake Carrington. Married to Linda Evans. Yeah. Yeah. But he's evil in like a. In a very contemporary slash timeless way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The coiffured demon. Yeah. He's one of the better villains. So just to be clear about what's happening. John Forsyth is playing a judge. He's playing the judge who simultaneously is responsible for one of our supporting characters being in in prison at this point, in a psych ward. Wrong, wrongfully right. imprisoned. Wrongfully imprisoned. And doesn't care. For a paperwork error, essentially. Yeah. And Pacino punches him, which was we see before the movie starts. Yes. So we know, like, oh, man. That's yeah. how bad it got. He punched the Pacino's judge. Pacino's in jail for contempt of court because he punched it or tried to punch a judge. Or tried to punch tried John, to John Forsyth. Forsyth. And so somehow John Forsyth is brought up or he's charged with rape and assault. Yeah. And Forsyth's political idea, his ingenious political idea, is to get as his lawyer Al Pacino's character. And Pacino's like, you got to be kidding me. Why would you want me to do it? And basically, it's like, well, listen, if you if people know that you tried to punch me out, but you're also going to represent me, I'm obviously I'm obviously innocent. Right. Right. And Pacino is suddenly in this pickle. And the question that he has is like, I, how do how does a lawyer do his job in the way that a lawyer is supposed to do it? But also knowing full well that they're in addition to everything else, like. One of my clients is in a really bad place in prison for the dumbest reason and then the dumbest other reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll do it, but you got to get my guy out. And Forsyth is like, I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do is always a good villain (laughs) moment. (laughs) It's It's really wild. Anytime you hear it with a guy who has looks like John Forsyth, who has that smug I'm going to slowly smoke a cigarette while I decide whether I want to ruin your life very or not. Very handsome yeah. still. He's I'll still see what very I can good do. looking. It's not going to go well. Some Ted Knight energy from him in this movie. Uh, he, he's like evil Ted Knight. Ted Knight. The, the movie is really- Because he he he's blithe about it too, right? Totally. He's not twisting his mustache. He's no. like, I'm a rich, handsome white guy. You're he's, not going to When they the go judge. into the pool, the sauna pool or whatever Yo, that man. is at his home, he's- He's like he's like he's Satan played, in there. Has know? he played golf with Judge Smales, you think? <laughs> like in a member guest? One thing I really like about the movie is it's really smart about a very simple fact that we all accept in our society, which is that lawyers all the time defend people that they know are guilty. Mm-hmm. And also lawyers all the time defend people that they know are innocent, but that are nevertheless sentenced to prison. Mm. And this like moral quagmire that being in this profession is and the absurdity that Levinson and Curtin are kind of underlining. Like, can you fucking believe that this is the world that we live the in. The line is where we so have to thin. do this. Yeah, yeah. it's re- it's just a really smart idea. And that little germ that you just explained for the movie—that's you can feel like that's where they started, right? They were like, mm-hmm. "How do we get 
a lawyer who punched out a judge to defend the judge to show the world that he's innocent. Like that's the that's the kernel that they pop from. It's really a great idea for a movie. So Norman Jewison, our guy, five best director nominations, zero wins, and then they gave him the Thalberg Memorial Award. That's what they do. Which I st- feel like we should start doing with the NBA MVP. Mm-hmm. Where we're, I'm trying to think of somebody who, ne- who like if Embiid had never won mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. he just finished second to Jokic like five years in a row. Is this your like, way to get Jason Tatum MVP award? <laughs> <laughs> this might be my only chance. <laughs> it's like, good, good news, Joel. You didn't ever win an MVP, but you've won the Irving Thalberg MVP award for career achievement. It um, just feels insulting. But anyway. The, name the five movies. Well, I don't have that. that uh, in the, in Let's the, see if we can name it. Well, I'll give you the night. The night. I wrote down who, his who did he 11. Lose to? It's a really interesting loss that he lost best director to. Uh, oh, wait, I know this. It's not Mike Nichols. It, it is. Is it Nichols? Mike okay. Nichols oh, for, for the, the graduate. graduate. Yeah. Okay. So just for the listeners, he rips off the Cincinnati kid in the heat of the night, Thomas Crown Affair. He does Fiddler on the Roof, Jesus Christ Superstar, and Rollerball. Just all stop right there. All in a row. Stop right his there. His 70s is amazing. Like, he does a Justice for All a couple years later, Soldier Story, Agnes of God, Moonstruck, Only You, and The Hurricane so, with Denzel Washington when he's late 70s at that yeah, point, 80? Yeah. No, he's, I, yeah, I think even older. I mean, those are, um, I just listed 12 movies that. So Moonstruck nominated for Best Picture, right? Fiddler yes. on the Roof nominated for Best yes. Picture. What else is on the list? Was The Russians Are Coming? The Russians Are Coming nominated That's for the, Best Picture? That's the I Alan Arkin movie. He was nominated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's one more in there. Was the hurricane nominated for Best Picture? No, I, but Denzel. Was. Denzel was okay. Not a fan. He uh, had no, a, a fan. he had a very smart director move, which I would do if I was a director, which I'm not. But he, he could be. It's a soldier story. That's the other one. He went and he went where the talent was. Uh huh. He wasn't like I'm just gonna make this movie and you won't know any of the people. He's like I'm gonna work with Pacino. I'm gonna work with James Caan at the heat of his powers. Mm-hmm. Like, on down the line, he's just. Major stars, stories that made sense. Rollerball is my favorite Norman Jewish movie, but I, I also love Rollerball probably I the most. Another Rollerball. great movie about it's systems really... and power oh, and not yeah. trusting yep. money yep. and all that. But like his career, best James Conn, yeah. Jonathan, yeah. Jonathan, Jonathan. Yeah. Best James Conn is a Isaiah. You've never seen Rollerball. Nah. Rollerball foretells the entire violent world of pro football and where it's going. Yep. We're, Nobody even knew it was happening. We're, we're waiting for your Rollerball. It's going to happen. It's. Um, it's Jewison's really important dude in movie history. Yeah, can you give him the one sentence scouting report of what like his style was? Did he have a style? Did not he didn't have, a have style. a style. Okay, he's the, you pointed out that he went to where the talent was. Um, he did a couple of things. When he comes to Hollywood, he's a Canadian kid, and he starts making like Doris Day and Tony Curtis movies, and he makes these three or four romantic comedies in the '60s, and then he basically gets to on the back of the new Hollywood coming around, and frankly, on Sidney Poitier's back. Mm-hmm. Gets to like elevate into a, a a status that many filmmakers from his generation didn't get a chance to do because a lot of guys who were younger than him were coming in at that time. But he makes it, it was the, the beginning of, the of New Hollywood. He's just in this in this gap. So how many exactly. of those guys bridged the gap where they were in the old era and the new era? Very few. Where they fit in. But he was smart because he he famously mentored Hal Ashby. Hal Ashby was the editor on Thomas Crown Affair and on Cincinnati Kid. And he had an eye for eccentric types who were really gifted. Mm -hmm. And so he was always bringing those people into his orbit. And he had really great taste. And he worked with Mirish on In the Heat of the Night. And so Mm -hmm. he was always getting Mm -hmm. good projects. But then he's like, he's made musicals. He's made romantic comedies. He's made these big epic movies. He's made sports movies. He's made courtroom dramas. He made Fist with Sylvester Stallone, this union movie. That's another talent he gravitated to. He is just one of the most flexible, but style Mm non-specific. Like he doesn't, you couldn't. By looking at a movie, you wouldn't be like, well, that's it. But they Jewish all shot. have something. They all like, you know, in the heat of the night, that that movie has style. Yeah. Right. Um, Fist, in its way, has style. Um, Moonstruck has no, style. No doubt. Right. But those I mean, these movies couldn't be less alike. Yeah. You know, but the thing that keeps them together, I'm thinking about Moonstruck in relation to Injustice for All. Right. Like just. The batting order <laughs> of these movies, the fact that the entire lineup can hit one out of the park whenever, whenever at any at bat in any inning can just happen. It's amazing. And I mean, and Justice for All isn't quite like Moonstruck level acting good, but everybody who's in this movie, whether you've got two scenes or 12, is 
ready to go, even when if your Craig T. Nelson is too much and you aren't ready to go toe to toe at Pacino, they're like he knows how to at least make these people make the most sense. Craig has a very unique career. Yeah. Kind of- I can't think of anybody. Stephen Frears is maybe right. a distant Some- second to right. Jewish. How many people had five decades making movies? Making really great, solid Hollywood, popular. Yeah. It's kind of in that like Spielberg movies. conversation where you're like talking about the people who really spanned eras and defined and res. mattered, right? Yeah. Like they made movies. Like talking, he's made so many rewatchable movies. Like I mean, what what if his movies aren't rewatchable? I've never seen Gaily Gaily. I don't know, starring Bo Bridges. I, I, I've never seen. It. You know, well, my memory of when this I don't remember that one either. <laughs> I know what that is, yeah. My memory of this movie when it came out was Pacino and crazy comedy, and I I can remember like the trailer and stuff, but. It became a Pacino. Yeah, it felt like he had seized the upper hand from De Niro mm. in that little battle that we were having in the 70s with all the young actors. Mm-hmm. And it just mm-hmm. felt like he was the guy. And then next year, Raging Bull happens just and say. then it flips. Yep. But um, but think about what it took. Think about what De Niro had to do to flip it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, you know, yeah. they all respond to De Niro and Raging Bull, right? That's how you get the shining, right? That's how you get Scarface. Right. That's how you get Mommy Dearest. Everybody wants a raging bull. Right. Um, it's a great observation. Yeah. $4 million budget made $33 million. Roger Ebert. Three stars. Hmm. A, listen. I would have added a half. This is a three and a half stars. But I mean, I think that it takes a while for the movie to get where it's going. And like my cousin Vinny, yeah. The 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 last the last courtroom sequence is so good mm-hmm. and so almost out of left field that it kind of makes you rethink the movie that you've just been watching and whether or not the people who made it knew of, of course they knew but it's so different it's so much heavier than what precedes it. I mean anyway, what does he say? Here's an angry comedy crossed with an expose and held together by one of those high voltage opportuno performances that's so sure of itself we hesitate to demure. Hmm. So yeah. this is kind of definitional for the rewatchables, but I'm going to present it like it's an original take. <laughs> Sometimes a three-star movie is just a lot better than a three-and-a-half-star movie. Yeah. Uh, you know? Three and I like half- the movie with a couple of flaws yeah. that's still like rollicking and yeah. entertaining. Yeah, like yeah, a three-and-a-half-star movie is like a movie that's trying to be Great. Yeah. This was as a person who had to use a star system for 11 years of his writing life. It like it was so much easier to give a movie three stars than three and a half because it just took all the pressure off. Right. Like you can really, right. really, really like it. Quibble a little bit, but ultimately just be comfortable in, in knowing, you know, when when the piece gets to the readers that they won't really have a lot to argue with in terms of... The reality is we screwed up with the star system. Yeah, sure. Like, I hated it. Meltzer for terrible. wrestling matches would do five-star matches. See, I prefer five stars. I five, five stars, stars is more is coherent to yeah. me. Yeah. 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 Because you have more options. Obviously, it's bigger. It's more numbers. But then it allows me but to think... But it's basically 10 numbers, right? Because it's three and a half, yeah. four, four That's and a half. That's what it is. That's yeah. how I think of it is. Did you get... Did you? Are you passing with a 70? too late? Can are we you getting it back? I mean, on, on my no. beloved letterbox, it's Whoa. five stars. That's what they use. That's what you and the letterbox psychos do? That's what we do. We use five stars. I believe that that is the most complete system if you have to we, use a they system. See how he's like, he's like a cult. A I'm an ombudsman. That's it. <laughs> I just, I'm a representative like, of the people. He's like him and Tedros on letterbox. <laughs> convincing yeah. Tedros? Everybody. No. Oh. We would never wow. welcome someone like that into our community. <laughs> no. Into the Tedros letterbox did. community? No. Oh, Sean's boy. wearing a shot collar and <laughs> handing out four stars. Uh, most rewatchable scene. It, it's weird. The opening scene is just awesome. Like just the whole stretch. You don't, you don't, it's like, wait, I thought Al Pacino was this. Where, what was the guy? What was the, the Aggie? Like Aggie. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're, we're with them for the first, what, five minutes? And mm-hmm. like, wait a second, mm-hmm. where are we going? And then all of a sudden, Pacino's in there in jail with piss dripping down his legs. And we're just off. We're ready to roll. Yeah. Cause they really wanted to show us, like, hey, this is how it goes. Um, there's, there's like a, Jazzy music soundtrack. I was going to have this on what stage the best. I'll just do it now. That is very specific to 
like basically 79 through night shift with Henry Winkler and Michael Keaton, mm-hmm. where yeah. it was like just it's it's weird synthesizer. It's a trumpet. It's some sort of like a yacht rocky kind of beat. Mm hmm. But it's Except, not good. It's like they haven't really figured out yes. all the elements together, but they just threw it together and they just put it on the thing. It's Dave Grusin, who I believe the last time we talked about him on the show, did the score for another courtroom film, The Firm. Yeah. Oh, that very memorable jazz firm. score. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one. I mean, I wonder what he would say the story is with this particular one, because, you know, this is a this is one of our like acclaimed jazz musicians in addition to like scoring a lot of American movies. Yeah. This one is almost like spare to the point of not really. You notice it in a way that I don't think is necessary. It's running, running counter. It's running hot to what's happening on screen. Next one, I have just Pacino and Lee Strasberg, who we didn't mention yet. Going to see him. Those scenes, they're fine. I don't like them. Well, I know fine. why they're there. We, you know, we you all know, know why they're there. I just love the Godfather two kind of mm-hmm. those guys mm-hmm. back Great together. Yeah. yeah, the scenes themselves, they're fine. They do it. Yeah, I maybe do one instead of two, but as someone who the str- first one, I think is good. I strongly believe that life is meaningless and then you die, and so because of mm-hmm. that, I feel that that thread is very powerful. We're basically like at the end of the movie, he's like, "Well, this man has dementia and he'll never remember who I am anymore because I forgot to come visit him three times," yeah. and that's right. life. You know, yeah. like, that's a pretty brutal But ending. also, like, it's another, it's just another thing he failed to do, right? Like, yeah, he right. did not have time. You know, it's... But look it, at the cost, you right. know? Yes, yes, yes. He's failed another person because there was no time to do it. To so do I it. have the Pacino and Christine Lottie flirting with each other. Well, going at it, but then it turns into he asks her out. And then they have a Chinese food date. Which yet again reinforces that if you were doing a movie with Pacino and it was like a romantic movie, I think it was a tough beat in the 70s and 80s. He just like, there's just, the cigarettes are just oozing out of him. He looks like he hasn't showered in a week and a half. I always feel bad for the actress. Yeah. Um, How many total hours of sleep do you think he got during the production of this movie? Oh my God. Probably none. Also, like, like this is the cocaine era. So I don't know. Who knows? It also, but he, I was thinking about this in relation to cruising. How, and how bad he looks in cruising versus how clean and showered he looks here. Mm. He looks very scrubbed. Right. But Um, but does he? Unslept to me, he does. Right. He seems tired, appropriately tired, but he also just seems a lot less. Haggard. He's in a lot of earth tones here. Mm. Of all the great actors we've ever had, he's the only one. Like he's eating Chinese food in front of her, and you're like, "This is just gross." (laughs) I don't don't know why it's gross to watch you eat Chinese food. Um, No, I wouldn't feel that way about no other great actor. He doesn't have a lot of vanity, you know. I mean, when he when he flips out later in the movie in front of the car, it's like that is not vanity. I mean, it's show offy, but it is. Yeah, he looks nuts. But also the state, like. Well, when we find out why he did it, right? Yeah. Like why he, we think we know why he's flipping out. Then we ner- we learn this other thing, and you're like, oh wait, it's worse. It's even worse than we thought. Yep, yep. I have Tambor and his buddy telling Pacino about the uh, Fleming's rape charge when Tambor just That's has a great scene. It's really hard to laugh that hard as an actor. I don't know how they like did. Tom it. Hanks and Money Pit is probably the ten out of ten for it. Just. Fully committing to the hysterical laughter, mm-hmm. but that's, that's Larry Bird, right? That's Larry Bird. Yeah. yeah, that's just a great scene. I just we have to mention the helicopter scene. It's a little crazy, but it is fun to fly around New York. Mm-hmm. I did like getting shots of the city. That's a, kind of a see. All the sequences with just him and Jack Warden feel like they're in another movie. Yes, yes, you know, it's true. They're in a slightly lighter on its feet movie. You know, a little goofier. But even little... that scene in the bat, that sort of macabre scene in the bathroom where they're telling him about about the judge, yeah, being accused for, of sexual harassment. There, there's just so many other ways to have delivered that information, yeah, yeah. but to do it in a bathroom and to crack up, right? At the like, I like the that he irony, checks the stalls first. <laughs> right. That the irony is just hilarious here for these guys. One of the things I like about the helicopter scene is the crash. <laughs> they actually just crash in the water and you yeah. don't understand what's happening. You think they're going to make it and they actually don't. And then he just gets out of the water. <laughs> He's so crazy. Uh, speaking of crazy, the plate throwing scene with Tambor. Love it. An incredible Love scene. It. Incredible. I, w- I rewound it and I kept watching and I was trying to figure out how they faked it. And I don't, they I think Jack Warden was, was just literally, literally blocking plates. I was watching this and I'm like, okay, Wesley, 
Would you want to be Jack Ward and getting well, plates? I was out thinking, here? like, what are the cops so afraid of here, right? <laughs> like, you just go in there. Right, just charge and at him. And just charge yeah, at him. Yeah. He's just throwing plates. They didn't have their riot gear that day. But what's interesting, can I just say, the, the thing that's amazing to me about that scene is i just been thinking about plate spinning, right? Like, in all of the things you have to keep in the air as a lawyer. Yeah, mm. and the thing that breaks the Tambor character is the realization that a person he got off from murder just killed more people. Yeah, and he goes from being the guy laughing in the bathroom over this judge's sexual harassment charge to Travis Bickle. Yeah, right. Right, and he shaves his head off, and he just loses it. He just goes completely like a kind of moral insanity. Yeah. I've never seen Mr. Roper this upset. <laughs> But that was the, cra the crazy thing about the stunt casting with him was he was just the guy in Three's Company. Nobody yeah. knew he was like a real dramatic actor like this. Yeah. No. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, I, that sequence is great. Well, another crazy sequence. <laughs> All of these scenes. Arthur attacks the car with the briefcase. Yeah. He's dead! Half yeah. an hour after they put him in the lockup, he hanged himself! It's just going nuts. <laughs> that scene is who Al Pacino becomes as an actor. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, that is when things are whether they're good or bad, you know, but Sen of a Woman and yeah. Devil's Advocate and all the things that were like what Jack and Jill and all the crazy shit that he does in movies. Attica Attica comes before this, but yeah. this that is the scene to me where I'm like, that's the pivot point when everybody is like, oh, this is the version of Al Pacino acting. He's acting hard. But it, it I works. thought it worked. It works. It's it, not a it criticism. has to like it, it works, works really well here. Right. Because yeah. the scene is well written. He genuinely seems distraught. Yeah. No, yeah. truly distraught. And what he says at the end of that sequence is like, where's your humanity? Yeah. Like, does nobody care about the fucking people? Yeah. Like, what are we doing here if we don't, if we're not caring about yeah, the people, what are we, what are we doing? I have three more. Arthur Pacino's character gets the uh, flaming pictures. Oh. From Uncle Junior. Mm. Um. We didn't mention Johnny Ola also making his reunion with Al Pacino oh, yeah. here too. Strasburg um, and Ola. the Fleming pictures are hilarious. Mm -hmm. I there's only three of them. I could have looked at another ten. It's like, what's going on in the sex <laughs> he's party? He's sort of like posing. He's like, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like who does this? John Forsythe. That's who. This this cocky judge. Then Fleming admitting to him that he's guilty is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is a big moment for like white male entitlement. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I mean, because there's just no now, reason for like this time, time. Not, all, not all well, the other times in history. <laughs> I think in the movies, right? Because that is essentially the other thing that's on trial here, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he's literally on trial for this, for the attitude, the effrontery of, of, the, of the ability to sort of do this to a woman and just be certain that he'll get away with it. Yeah. And I think, you know, you don't really see that kind of like bargain basement evil very often right where there were the stakes he didn't you know it's not murder it's not he's not running a like an evil crime ring you know it's like yeah. this is very like terrible nuts and bolts human being interaction here mm -hmm. that he is just brushing off as his as his god-given american right to be able to do. and doubles well, and down on when they get in the courtroom oh, right yeah i mean points are out that's that's dark that's a very it's dark moment. and i i almost feel like at this point he's trying to get pacino to break i and it works and i mean works. that is the critical moment in the movie right i won that was an, an unanswerable question i have for this episode last scene would be the uh the big scene yeah which don't sleep on him finishing going hold it i just completed my opening yeah. statement <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good line uh he's not even in the frame at that point. He's yeah, outside he's the courtroom off. too. Yeah. <laughs> is that the number one uh, lawyer courtroom scene for you? Of all time? Yeah. I, I, we talked about this. I love Newman's um, the verdict, final, the closing, final closing, closing statements statement. and the yeah. verdict. I think it's just the way it's shot so far away like that. I love that scene. Um, God, that's a good one. There's we talked some... about McConaughey in A Time to Kill breaking down. I love it, but it's so hacky the at the same yeah. time, yeah. you know? Like it got me. Um I like hacky sometimes. This is definitely I mean, I've got some weird ones, right? Like I I've I this will be another opportunity for me to bring up legally blonde. 
Oh yeah. You know, I mean, we're talking about Linda about, Cardellini breaking down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that there are just like great moments where a lawyer is doing something lawyerly. I think that, you know, um, Pesci and my cousin Vinny, it's just like a really good example of like a particular kind of lawyer, lawyering yeah. that works. Um, we didn't, we're, you know, we're not, this is, I really like this movie called Music Box, which comes out in 1988 mm. with Jessica Lang defending her oh, Nazi yeah, yeah. dad. Yeah, I remember that. Um, and her real, like the stuff that that character has to do in the Jessica Lang who got an Oscar nomination. Do you think that's the best that. defending my Nazi dad movie or no? Is there <laughs> other ones? <laughs> Well, so this one puts that whole run in the late 80s. It's a he, great this future theme month here on the rewatch. Spending my nuts to dad, but that's August. <laughs> Tough one. Uh, I mean, but my, this is this is this but, is definitely number. You know, number. my favorite is though. What's your favorite? Is a, the, it's a, is a, a few good. Co- did you order the code red? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that's the yeah, that's, that's the best one. The, Sean's no, right. I, I'm this one. I I have to say, like, I have not watched a few good men in a few years, but watching Injustice for All. In the last week, this the seek the thing that moved me about it is there are stakes. They're like are stakes so much bigger than what happens in a few good men, right? It, it's saying more about the world. I think I don't know if I've ever been more on the seat edge of my seat in a movie that doesn't feature like a scene that doesn't feature a gun than right. in a few good men. The first yeah. time I watched it, where I was like. Like leaning. Yeah, no, 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 that's fair. To that's see fair. if he could get Nicholson to go where he wanted to go. Who's going to defend him? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's nothing But I better. guess the, the difference for me is that movie is telling you. It's already told you what it's going to do. But you, we, ha- we innately want to be yeah, satisfied. Yeah, we still don't know if he's going to actually get the, him to get the code The thing yeah. that's I'm thrilling about Pacino here is that you don't know. It's the same where thing where you going. don't know it's if he's actually going to do, it, do or not. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. But, but in also, this case, he, but also, he does it, but doesn't do it. Right. Th- I also think that like he it, banishes himself at the end of this movie. Yeah. It kind of can't count if I don't know. There's something about it involved. All right, I take it back. I'm not even going to say what I was going to say. I was thinking about like you, like like having a scene partner. Mm-hmm. But this Pacino, the thing that's great about it is that it's just him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's him. Right. In the court, in the theater of the courtroom, essentially giving a performance for the jury, for his client, for this woman who is looking for justice, for the judge. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like there's so many people, so many constituent parties in this performance. They make a point of showing the woman at the end. Right. Yeah. And I just feel like the stakes are simultaneously specific to every party involved, including you know, justice for his, for for McCullough, the guy who he got sent to prison by John Forsythe's character. Yeah. For Aggie, who died because he was, it's just it's so complicated, and there's so much he's getting out of himself about what's wrong with the legal system. I just feel like that to me, what what all is on Pacino's shoulders in that moment, and the the transcendent way that he is acting through all that and just like the idea that like you think that's truth- more than matthew mcconaughey solving racism at the end of time to kill <laughs> i i want to throw in a little honorable mention for he's uh, solving racism <laughs> <laughs> i i uh what about back into the left back into the left oh that's a good one back into the left that's a courtroom scene yeah that's a really good one mm-hmm. I think you might be right about a few good men. Th- I think that's the most exciting scene. It's like you know what it's I thought of as, satisfying. as you were talking it about what, all the stuff Pacino's trying to do in that last scene. It reminds me of Hoffman and Tootsie mm. with the mm-hmm. big reveal mm-hmm. that he's like, mm-hmm. "I'm actually her brother." <laughs> and he takes the wig off, <laughs> but he sets it up this certain way, and it's getting there, and it's like, "Oh no, he's not going to actually do it, is he?" And then, and he whips the wig off. Yeah. And yeah. it's the same thing with Pacino, where it's building to this. Is he gonna do it? Is he gonna actually say he thinks this guy's guilty? This is a great guilty? comparison because it's, but it's the opposite energy, right? Right? Yeah. It's like he's actually a he. There's fear in him about you know in doing it, right? There's a real risk. There's so much risk in that in that reveal too. Um, I feel like Pacino. The other thing about this moment here is his loss of control. Yeah. Right. Which starts when he demolishes the car. Right. Yeah. Well, and then I mean, it really starts 
But once he's blackmailed into having to take the gig, right? Well, I had right. this in What's Age the Best, the one of my favorite movie tropes, not a courtroom trope, but the trying to talk somebody into putting the gun down mm. when they have the, mm. the yeah. guns trained on them. And then the guy forgets and he stands up. And then our hero says, no! And he stands up and gets wiped out. Yeah. That's when it starts. But I always like when that, when they do that in a movie, it always works for me. There's so many scenes in the movie that are so epically tragic. Yeah, but that feel like they a previous scene was just two guys giving each other shit. You know, like it's a <laughs> right. really mm-hmm. it's talk so, about their mm-hmm. fantasy. It's like, so chaotic. Mm-hmm. So we go last scene for most rewatchable, or would you go something else? I think it's the last. Scene. I think yeah. so too. It's the last scene. What's age the best? I wrote down those late '70s soundtracks with lots of swervy sax- saxophones and Congo beats and weird disco shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it still gets me. Um, this anecdote age the best. Pacino frequently ad-libbed and improvised, and Lee Strasberg got mad at him and said, ah, learn your lines, darling. (laughs) And then Pacino later recognized it was good advice. Uh, (laughs) Thank God. Barry Levinson in Baltimore movies? Mm -hmm. The first of many for him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Wire connection we mentioned. The uh, the trans stuff in this movie for 1979 isn't a disaster. I was no, it's shocking. No. Yeah, it, it actually like handled really sensitive. Character I was has surprised. dignity. Like you understand the perspective. Like it's it's given the given 1979 of it. It's yeah. pretty I surprising. Mean, and you, but but the thing is that the it does not work if if Arthur does not believe in this person's humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If he does not believe that this person is simultaneously here for. Almost no reason, right? Like, I mean, there is a legal reason he is here, but does not need to stay, right? This you this person needs to egg, be exited out of the system. There's an even bigger comment in the in that character and in a lot of the movie, which is like, this is small time shit. Right. Why are yeah. we wasting our yeah. time in the justice system so on these much. petty crimes yep. when there's so many bigger problems that we have? Which is part of his inquiry and his you know dialogue with Christine Lottie's character is all about like you're just missing the point. You're missing the point of how what you really need to be spending your time examining here. Smart. Arthur believes in three things, humanity, justice, and eating Chinese food in the most disgusting yeah. way possible. Yeah. He's trying to seduce his Ripping 12 heaters <laughs> while <laughs> crushing some <laughs> general South chicken. Chicken fried rice yeah. falling off his face. <laughs> hey, honey, want to hit the sack? Um, oh, my God. Any other what's age best for you guys? Um, other than the Norman Jewess at IMDb? Uh, yeah. That has that aged well. I think Jeffrey Tambor and Christine Lottie's first movies is pretty good finds. Um, yeah, nice job. I, and also just like, and Craig T. Nelson's first movie too. So that's three pretty well-known people. Famous people. This is another good jury movie. Like we've been talking, I've been, you know, we've been talking about um, in the other, in these other courtroom movies about like what the jury is doing. Mm-hmm. The jury selection. And Chris Ryan said he would love to be cast as a jury member. <laughs> this is where a, he could just this be, is a be completely, like super intense or surprised. This is completely true. But at 7.30 this evening, I will find out if I am to serve on a jury tomorrow in Los oh Angeles boy. County. So uh, I will let you know whether or not it's a good emotional oh, experience. Should we give a heads up to the letterbox community? <laughs> that you might be I out for a couple time hours. Off. <laughs> Guys, I'll be sure not to, alert. Be able to rank any they movies know, it's today. Like, it's, it's like telekinesis, you know? They just they can read my mind and I can send messages to them oh without saying a word. Well, the jury in this movie is riveted to Al Pacino. Yeah. Like, they are yeah. I don't even know if that's accurate. Well, it's, I think they are it's just probably not. They're probably like, holy shit, this guy's an amazing completely actor. Completely wrapped. I think it's also in great contrast to the Craig T. Nelson opening statement when he's like, let's make our goal line stand. And you're like, this guy's yeah. so full of shit. Yeah. Like, right. Get this guy out of here. Yeah. Kid Cudi Pursuit of Happiness where Best Needle Drop. It's that crazy theme song in the beginning. They don't really No pop dabble. songs, right? Yeah, they don't really squeeze any other songs into this for the most part. There's like a gospel disco. There's, there's something oh, here. The end. the end. Yeah, there's like a. Yeah, you're right. I tried to find the song. It's like a children's I, choir? I couldn't. No, mm. it's like a it's like a gospel choir. Okay, yeah, I noticed that in the credits, and then I turned the movie off in the credits. Big Kahuna Burger Award for Best Use of Food and Drink. We're going with Worst this time. It's the Chinese food date that I've mentioned three times. Den of Thieves Benihana Award, Scene Stealing Location, Downtown Baltimore. Moving into the Great Shot Gordo Award for Most Cinematic Shot, Warden on the Ledge. Yeah, And it's one of those how-did-they-do-this shots, which he really sat in the ledge. He had, like, mm-hmm. the little harness underneath to make sure he didn't fall over, but... I like that shot of him 
where it's like, how are they doing this? But then you also get to see Baltimore in the background. It's good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, Baltimore in the background, there's a great shot of Christine Lottie and Al Pacino walking when he's explaining to her about the, mm -hmm. the, the pictures. Yeah. And they're, you they're know, in the outside background, the you can see a bunch of, or, yep, yeah. there's a bunch of mills and warehouses behind them, including the in clean Baltimore's Domino Sugar Plant. Right. Is, is that the, that's the Inner Harbor, right? Now. Isn't that in the, yep. the, yeah, I love the Inner Harbor in Baltimore. We don't get to give this out all the time. The, Mar the Mallory Rubin Award for did this movie need a better sex scene? <laughs> the answer is no. It actually, we didn't need a Pacino it sex scene. It didn't need any sex scene It didn't need at all. The answer is no, thumbs down. What about more open mouth kissing <laughs> scenes? <laughs> Chip with Chinese food. Oh, listen. Soy sauce on your cheek. At least they know how to kiss. Did which, they? I didn't really pick up on yeah, that. No, yeah, they, they was they, that was kiss. real. Okay. That was some kissing. Good for them. The Butch's Girlfriend Award for the weak link of the film. The judge just tells him I did it. Are we sure? We sure he should have done that, that that was realistic, that I know they're trying, he's trying to egg Pacino on, but for what reason? So Pacino could flip out and then ruin his case for like a mistrial. What's his, I actually, what's his motive there? I actually don't. I mean, I, I like that you think that there was some scheme happening. I, See, I just, just it's just a pure power, rich I guy, rich white guy arrogant. power play. I think it's hmm. just pure arrogance. That was my read of it, but I, I, I like this. I think the mistrial like theory is strong because that is ultimately what happens, obviously. I like this. But I never like in any show or movie when we get to the end and the bad guy's like, so I did it and here's how I did it. But the good Unless thing, it's primal fear. Right. Unless it's primal fear. <laughs> but the then good we need thing it. about this movie is that it's not about that, right? No. It's there's not, like no. five other things that have as many, as it's there's, there's as much at stake in these other plot uh, lines as as this trial. that's what distinguishes this movie from every other movie that we'll do in the theme month is that it's not really about the case mm -hmm. yeah you know it's mm -hmm. about the people and it's about the court system what's age the worst the fucking metallica song just overwhelmed the google <laughs> results for that this song movie rocks though. it's an amazing it's song, song but couldn't they have called it like slightly different they don't, probably don't even know you the movie. You Google it, it's I like agree. just McTalka shit. They I don't agree. Know then you gotta like keep scrolling down. It's like, oh, there's this that? Pacino movie where he got nominated for an Oscar. Even though it's 10 Joseph years later. I mean, it is named know. after the Pledge of Allegiance. It's not right, like it's he fine. invented, you know, just Barry Levinson didn't have the come same up name. with the phrase <laughs> Justice like for All. I don't like it. That's one thing that drove me. I didn't like have it. The movie opens with the kids saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I just like, okay. It feels very 1979. Yeah. What's oh, I, that was my next what's age the worst? The crazy long opening credits <laughs> during an era when they didn't realize you could just start the movie and have the credits yeah. at the end of the movie. I feel like the movie is pretty brisk too. Yeah. It's not yeah. really that slow. It's, it's but this was brisk. definitely a late 70s, early 80s. You will now sit here and watch four minutes of credits. I don't really have a problem with that, if I'm being honest. I yeah. love 70s opening credits. Yeah, I like to see who worked on the movie. <laughs> That's yeah. something that matters. I don't really like this convention of like we don't just, do credits. We just start the movie. I don't like that either. Do you guys talk about this on Letterboxd or no? Like favorite credits? Five All star you're credits doing against. is giving us power. Keep saying that word out loud, Bill. Um, so this is a dumb at what stage the worst, but so when Tambor shaves his head, mm -hmm. now not shocking, right? Everybody shaves their head in 2023. There's shaved heads everywhere. Oh, wow. You're you're going back to no one ever shaved their head back in Nobody ever shaved their head. Only, I mean, I mean, it was a sign of like, you might be insane if right, you shaved your Travis head. Travis Bickle. I mean, it's not right. it was like boxers action. and right. Travis Bickle. Mm -hmm. And take. that I mean, was when Michael Jordan shaved his head. Like, a, I'm going to say 90, 91. It was like a big deal. Mm -hmm. Luke Gossett had the right. shaved head and officer and so a gentleman. Like, it was, this Telly Savalas is a madman. That was another one. Yeah. But, Telly Savalas. But I mean, he came to us that way. Right? Yeah. Imagine right. changes. Right. Born that way and he died I mean, that shaving, way. Bruce, shaving your head was always a sign of mental instability mm -hmm. in movies I mean, and TV shows. This was the thing about Bruce Willis. Right. This is a person who maybe of all the stars we had, Woody Harrelson, perhaps, too. Mm. But but Bruce Willis was the person who was like, I don't know what you want me to do. This is yeah. this is what's happening. I have a, the peninsula of Florida on the top of my right. head. <laughs> and that's just how it's going to go. This guys. is how it's going to go. Yeah. And it probably, you know, he was also one of those people that they talked about in terms of it's just wild. that so like in. So we got hung up on McConaughey and his hair. Mm -hmm. Talking it's about, about time did, to kill. Did McConaughey's hair keep him back from a better but IMDb? For men, I hadn't even thought about this. Huge, huge problem in the industry, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, now they just create hair from scratch. Can't relate. 
<laughs> well, la di da. Yeah. Okay. Good heads of hair. I don't have a lot going those. for me, but I do have that. <laughs> what else do you have for what stage is the worst? Um, I've got a lot of things. Wesley, this is Wesley's favorite category. <laughs> I really don't understand what kind of lawyer Christine Lottie is supposed to be. Yeah, she stands for were... nothing. Every time Pacino, she's sometimes with Pacino, like this, this, this is this is the corruption that we're trying to fight. Oh, you should absolutely maybe reconsider your defense of this. I mean, she doesn't believe in anything. I know that this is supposed to be like a symbolic representation of like staying on the fence. Yeah. But it's exasperating because the person that we really believe in morally and like kind of like as a person a lot is, is it, also is sleeping yeah. with this nothing burger yeah. she's of a, a human being. She, and she's just, the, her character is a device. Yeah. Thank God Christine Lottie is playing She's a good actor. Because yeah. Christine Lottie can, can act past the dumbness of the part. But come on. Can I've, she? I like her. I, 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 she's she's just got a really great natural presence. I agree. I, I, I always like Christine liked her. Lottie, Joe Beth Williams, Mary Beth, um, Hurt. Mary Kay Place. Mm. Um, you put them in something. D. Wallace Stone. A lot yeah. of, you know, Do you have I mean, to have three names to be in this? Well, Christine Lottie, yeah. to her credit, you know, uh, I don't know if she had one. She'll be coming up later in the recasting couch. <laughs> Shocking. Any other what's age the worst? Um, I, I think if you do this movie now, yeah. Jeff McCullough, I think Jeff McCullough is a white guy for the audience. The guy who John Forsyth sends away for the trap, uh, you know, right? Like the idea that like the the thing, the person we care most about, maybe even before Aggie. A white guy getting script, around by the script. Is a, is a white yeah. guy getting screwed by the system. I mean, you know. It's very 1979. Come on. Um, and I'm sure the story is probably that he gave the best audition or something like that. But like. As a character, you f in the movie, you do care. But I just kept thinking, like, really? This is the person getting most screwed in 1979 by the system? Okay, whatever. Um, it's been in, and in Baltimore. And in, and in Baltimore? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Barry Lines. You have any what's age the worst? Uh, I do not like the score as much as I like Dave Gerson. I like, I like uh, it. Makes, it really him. ages the movie instantaneously. I'm with you. Ron Burgundy flew to word, best time for a pee break. No. Mm -hmm. Stay in your seats. Oh, yeah. Wow, passing yeah. on. Interesting. What about, hmm. Nah, stay in your seats, everybody. Inter that's a, a sign of, an, of a tightly constructed, yeah. but also chaotic movie. It's really good. Was there a better title for this movie? No. Best quote. There's law and there's order. Taps the gun. Hmm. And that's order. Yeah. yeah. Jack Worded. Yeah. He's yeah. also on the move. I like on the move lines of dialogue like that. I think he's yeah. leaving... His chambers. And obviously you're out of order. That's like the signature quote. Right. Here's uh, my Stephen A. Smith how to take a word. I think this is Pacino's second best performance ever. So oh. that's Amen. Not yeah. hot? No, disagree. No, no I disagree. No. It's very hot. Keep going. Wait. We'll discuss. Oh, it. you oh it's not not even in the top five. Oh. Okay. Ooh. I got Godfather part two. Yep. Oh no. And okay. Then I have this second. Okay. Yeah. Are we is Dog this for there, when later are we talking about this? Is this not the time it's to talk right about now? It? I mean, Dog Day Afternoon has to, has to, has to, has to be in the top over five this. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay, hundred percent because it's this, but more nuanced with a more complicated character, in my opinion. Um, and I, I, I like a lot of the later stuff too. Like, I, I really like Donnie Brasco. Of course, I love Heat. Yeah, um, I don't I know. If he, I don't know if Heat is in this conversation. I always third. like. I always like the Any Given Sunday. I mean, that's that, and that's saying nothing of Godfather One, Scarecrow, Serpico, like all movies that I think are all feature, literally, literally some of the best movie acting in American history. You know, I have Heat third because Heat's got a great ass. <laughs> <laughs> you got your head all the way up it. Um, um, you have a hottest take. This is number two for you of all time? That's why my t I thought it was a hot take to put it to. What I would say. There's two Godfather movies in the 70s. I am embarrassed to say I would put Any Given Sunday in the top five. I, I think he's phenomenal he's, in that movie. The speech is like some he's, of the best stuff of his whole career. He's very good in that movie. The inches that are all around us. Sea of Love? Sea of Love's good. 
Okay, now you're just naming. Another gross, <laughs> another gross sex scene though. I, I, the thing. He's the Michael Carlito's Jordan. Way. Of gro- That's the one. Carlito's, Carlito's way. This. What a soulful performance that is. Not putting that over. Justice this is Rock. an entire construction, right? There is architecture. The insider. What are you doing, Lowell Bergman? What are you doing? I'm just That's saying movie You're just naming movie. You're throwing movies at me. This what about movie. Dick Tracy? He wins the championship belt with this movie. He this... takes it from De Niro. What about in Godfather 3 when he's like, it was not what I wanted. <laughs> That's one of the great movie moments of the 1990s. Come on, you guys oh are crazy. God. This All you're doing is making it more. <laughs> you're you're making your what point. we're saying all the truth. Oh, you missed. Wesley said. Marissa Tomei should have been the Sofia Coppola part in Godfather oh, Three, and it's incredible. a different movie. I love that. You One said great... that. I just did. I say it? It? that's your idea. <laughs> oh, I just fully. I'm oh, sad I said that it, it wasn't. <laughs> you. I felt like we came up with it together. Yeah, no, it's almost like you've done you two build. podcasts today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a hundred percent, I like we. Nobody that is, is really disagreeing good. with you. Yeah, that does that really movie good. win best? Two Oscars. At yeah, does that win best best film that year? I don't think that's the only thing holding that movie back. For what it's worth, no, that's the biggest thing holding it back. We, but you, you, it was hard to see at the time what else was wrong with the movie because yeah, yeah. that was so yeah. unbelievably wrong. I just want to say real quick about this being the, the second, this being one of the like top two to three Al Pacino performances. Mm-hmm. It's at the end of this run. He has figured out how to be a screen actor in a way that allows him to create a character who makes sense, who's going on a journey, right? Yeah. This is a great script for the kind of actor he is mm-hmm. because it lets him arrive at these explosive points. Yeah, it's a, it's right? a, it's the Nirvana song. It's loud, quiet, loud. It's like, it's you gotta go up, and then he comes way back down to his super internal. And then he goes up, and then he goes way back down. But once he's up, he kind of stays up there, right? Because like, he gets broken by the system. Right. I, I do think that like there's a way for him to start the movie coming out of that jail cell keyed up mm-hmm. so you have dog day afternoon over, over this. i would take dog day afternoon i would take both godfather films and dog day afternoon definitively over wow this. i find him mildly exasperating in dog day afternoon that's just wrong. i think it's i, a, I, I, I think have it's more a, respect for you than anybody i think it's as a great piece of acting but there's something about that performance that gets on my nerves that's and i point. think you know what i think it's the up down it's the up down of that. Of I that. can't put Godfather one over it because I just can't get out the K Corleone pieces scenes that it just drags it down to below top two. But those are Do the you scenes want that on that... your tombstone. K. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Simmons. Hey, I'm back from Italy. My wife blew up. Come with me. <laughs> Leave Simmons. all these 15 school kids behind you. Loving father. Extraordinary. <laughs> the K Corleone character is bad. Producer, in Godfather one. I'm, I'm, I've been right. People agree with me. Beloved husband, She's good in Godfather too. Son and father. Yeah. Guy hated Kay Corleone. That's the last in Godfather one. Bad character. She you, doesn't take you have him an back. About that? He moved to Italy and married somebody else, and he she never heard from him for four years. Yeah. My and friend, then he came back. He's like, get in the car. We're lo- leaving. Love We're is back. Lo- love is love. My friend Brian's gonna kill me for saying this, but I feel like what's happening in The Godfather is a young actor trying to figure out how to make himself make sense as Marlon Brando's son. Mm -hmm. That is a very interesting acting challenge that to me has never really been that thrilling. It's Uh, gotta wrap this episode up. <laughs> we gotta wrap it up. We're, we've entered a new level of SAS hot takes. Hot takes. Are we sure Al Pacino is good Woo! in The Godfather? Woo! I just am saying it's bold. I appreciate it, it the is boldness. A, it is. A, I. It's not even that I think it's a bad performance. I'm just in this in the pantheon of Pacino of great Pacino achievements, of which that is obviously one. Yep. I would take Injustice for All as a as a as a performance that has to justify the existence of a movie. The Godfather is great. Almost yeah, no matter that's who different, plays But that's different. That Corleone. is not the I same thing. Corleone. Sorry, Michael Mike, Corleone. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just feel like this is a completely next level challenge for a great actor. But Injustice I have a hotter for all, take. Like, you, like Gene Hackman can't do Injustice for All? He no, could, but me. it's not. I have a hotter take. This. Okay, good. 
Michael Corleone, Godfather One. Not that hard of a part. All right. This is what, just this basically is our last time episode of the show, guys. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm just glad you're able to be not here. Not that today. much to do. It's. Uh, I'm really glad that we've now completely gone. What is he got to do? We're, we're, we're looking glass. He's turn. just being super quiet. I and just. I'm. I just. Yeah, yeah. Godfather 2 I don't is, know what the fuck is going the, on the right Godfather right? 2 is the best act for the last 50 years Godfather 1 he's feeling his way in the in part the, movie, the great moment in the movie one Louis of my restaurant. favorite pieces of acting is yeah, exactly that is one of the great pieces of acting he's unbelievable I've, I've never seen in a movie so which one is it is it that it's one of the greatest pieces of acting you've ever that seen that scene, or scene. <laughs> that scene don't think it's that hard of a part Listen, I actually think I'm with Bill on this one. <laughs> Insane! <laughs> it's not that hard. The movie literally the doesn't work without him the, making the transformation agree. through the process What's of the, the movie. We're not from. He's the, great. We're saying he's great. But do we, I think De Niro could have also played the part? Yes. Do I think John Cazale could have played Michael Corleone? Oh, yes. Wow. That's. That's interesting. This goes right in the dumpster. This whole conversation. <laughs> you should see, you should just cut this out. You should cut this out and you should send this to the CIA and just have it examined for demonic messages. Okay. I, I got to call my father to make sure I think he got shot. <laughs> oh, man. He's really good. It's not, it's this not a top not, five Pacino. This is not though. about, right. This stuff, this for me is not what? about, I think there's a way in which like, the 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 sort of the team of the movie right is sort of making the performance in the movie seem greater than it actually. Well, is. it is an incredible ensemble. Right. Not as you know, and Justice for All is not. You see, one the of same. the best five guys in Godfather One. What? The one of the best five talking? performances. Okay, I put now Brando. Now he just wants. Now he's John Forsythe in you. Yeah. No, he's Forsythe. Brando's you. better than him. Uh huh. Kazale's better than him. No, okay. Because Khan like is better than him. the whole movie, Fredo. Khan is better than him. Three people that are just flat out better than Khan, him. Khan, so maybe he's Khan, the fourth, who, as you know, is one of my better than heroes. Him? I don't think I don't think Khan to the is moon. That, that good in that movie. Actually. Overacting to the moon. He's phenomenal. And his energy is unparalleled. Khan is amazing in that movie. But he's better than Al Pacino in The Godfather? <laughs> Godfather what, are we on 1. Drugs? <laughs> on one, Godfather 1. This is just nuts. Listen. I think that ev like I think the thing about Injustice for All, just to get back to courtroom, mode, yeah. is I really do believe that I would I would actually pick this performance as being um the full package Pacino. It's just everything that he's learned. Yeah. As I, an actor. I won't argue that. And he is building a character that there's a lot of risk in. You know, there's a lot of trust and risk in 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 Jewish and and the editor being able to pull it together, right? Mm -hmm. This could go wrong in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And I think the thing about Sonny Corleone is like half that performance is just observation. Michael. Right? Sorry. Michael. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Michael Corleone is just it's just observation. Yeah. He's and laying back. I think is Clemenza better than him in that movie? I don't know. It's an argument. <laughs> <laughs> should we get Chris Broussard in here as well? Will Nick should oh, Nick Wright no. join us so we can oh, discuss boy. this? Jeez. Get the whole crew. Now, you know I love Pacino. I just think Godfather One was a way yeah. easier part than Godfather Two. Godfather Two is like the hardest plane to land that you can. Well, Coming up next on First Things First, Orson Welles overrated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that fight's been fought. Come, Come on. on, you guys are. That, and we know the this answer. is a great segment with just riddled with with indecency. This is the hottest take segment. I'm doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> Casting what ifs we did. Um, Ruffalo, Hannah, Rubinick, Partridge, Overacting Award. Hmm. Craig T. Nelson we... is yeah. Yeah. That's... not really ready to be in a championship what? round fight. Like, well, like you said, when Pacino's trying to get him to drop the case and he like leans into him. And he's oh, like, I just found that so rude. It's very yeah. TV movie. -ish. Yeah. It's just like, oh, and Pacino... Being the actor he, he lays is, back. he's just like, okay, yeah, spit on me. I don't care. It's a good scene, but he's... Best that guy him. award. Uncle Junior. Yeah. It's the car crash in the beginning. This movie is really... If you really break it down by... Like, behaviorally break it down, it's really depressing. A lot like, of bad people. When, when he shows... When Pacino shows up at that car crash, and though there's a woman in the car, and you know that he has hired the woman to, like, yeah. suck him off or whatever... And he tells her, get out of here. Yeah. Get away from me. And she's standing in the background of the shot being like, is anybody, this is a black woman in a fur coat, is anybody going to acknowledge that I am here? Are you even going to focus on me? She's just a 
blur in the background. It's just, it's just such an indictment of so many things without ever saying in a Patty Chayefsky way, she doesn't get a speech. Yeah. The speech, her speech is being blurred in the background. Yeah. It's just um, such a, ugh. He is not the winner of the Best That Guy Award, Uncle Junior. It is that guy who also, who dies in this movie because he gets shot by the SWAT team, mm. who also dies halfway through the Warriors oh, yeah. because they kicked him off the movie because he was so fucking annoying. <laughs> and they fired him halfway through the movie and used an extra and threw him on the subway tracks. And we never saw that guy again. It was supposed to be him and Michael Beck as the stars of the Warriors. Is and that this, what happened? Yeah. And this guy was so annoying that they were like, he's out, he's fired. And they hired an extra and chucked him in front of a train. Thomas Waits. Yeah. Yeah. Also wow. in The Thing a couple of years later. I did not know that. That is a that's And he an acted like story. hot shit during The Warriors because he knew he had this Al Pacino movie coming. And he's mm. like, I'm the next guy. Mm. Wow. Deion Waiters Award, probably Uncle Junior, right? He's in like two scenes. He's coming in hot both times. Would you, you guys have Thomas ever Waits recognized too. him, by the way? Yeah. I was staring at him like, I, like, I, that, just, who, I was I, like, uh, He just has that very specific intonation that I can hear Uncle Junior's voice in my head probably until I die. He's so, so much handsomer older than yeah. he is younger. Recasting couch. Can I give you two people instead of Christine Lottie? Oh, interesting. Yes. Meryl Streep. Okay. Kramer versus Kramer or Meryl Streep. I think she was busy that year. Jane Alexander. Oh, I believe that. But Interesting. Too, but maybe too, hmm. She couldn't have done the blitheness of the part, right? Like, I think I would have found that character even more annoying if a more serious seeming actor had taken it. Can I give you one more? Yeah. Sure. Margot Kidder. Oh. A little daffy, I think, for this part. You know, I rewatched Sisters because I read. The, I, oh, I talked to. I was this. dealing you with bring this Tarantino book. book. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I so I I had been watching the movies as my boyfriend's been reading the book, um, and so some of them I would I would jump in and out of. You guys but are so cute. I yeah. I mean, okay. one guy's reading a book, the other guy's <laughs> watching the movies about the books. What a relationship! That is actually quite sweet. Um, yeah, he put on sisters and i came sisters in for is, most of it holy yeah fucking it's amazing shit. sisters is where i hate when 99 percent of the movies are remade and that would actually be an interesting remake but it's, she margot kidder phenomenal jennifer yeah. salt is not that great not that, no she's no not she's not kind of but margot link. kidder you watch her and you're like okay what what happened yeah what happened to you? she's amazing well i think I we know, know what happened, but, yeah. right? But <clears throat> nonetheless, she's smoldering hot in the Amityville Horror. Oh, she's just like she's even wondering. the demons like wow. Every... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. she's so good, and you know Superman. I mean, having her be Lois Lane, yeah. it just that could have been a good Marco Kidder movie. She, she would have been. She maybe she would have been good. I think this. she would have right. overwhelmed. I don't know. It would have. I don't know what Pacino is doing with that energy. You know. Yeah, Christine Lottie's not overtly sexy she also isn't overt at all yeah right there's yeah. nothing margot kidder is an overt actor right yeah and that part does i don't think that part like you wouldn't believe that that person if margot kidder played her that she'd be so neutral on everything mm -hmm. you wouldn't believe she'd be on the fence the whole time half ass internet research everything's filmed in baltimore mm. pacino did the you're out of orders seen 26 times what um, like in front of a camera? I'm sorry, he practiced it. Oh, okay. uh, it's a building lens. Sounds lunch. exhausting. Because it seems like he just did it once. The uh, the part where Jack Warden fires the pistol in court, apparently Norman Jewison and said in the audio commentary was based on some judge in Texas who used to do that. Hmm. The coffee cake scene with Warden and Pacino took 26 takes and Warden threw up because he ate too much. <laughs> you like coffee cake? I used to, yeah. I'm not... not You're out on coffee cake. Well... Yeah. This is kind of similar to how you old. used to feel about Al Pacino and The Godfather. <laughs> Listen, it's the hottest take segment. I'm just doing my job. Um, Are we sure coffee cake is good? <laughs> coffee cake, coffee cake is great. Coffee cake I is great. Coffee There's coffee nothing cake. better than coffee cake. Intimus coffee cake? I grew up on that. Barry Levinson said uh, of research in the film in real life courtrooms, the first thing that strikes you is not to trust your first impressions. We'd see someone and say, gee, he looks like a nice guy, and then discover he'd butcher his whole neighborhood. The second reaction is truth and justice aren't necessarily the same. Every trial is a unique personal drama with different motivations and circumstances. We want the law, the verdict to be absolute. 
Mm. And a lot of the time it's not. Yeah. And he revisited that theme a couple times in his career. Homicide life on the street. Yeah. Yep. There you go. Yep. Um, Apex Mountain. Pacino. And an avalanche about that. I think yep. Godfather 2 for Pacino. Apex Mountain. Still. Hmm. I won't argue that. Jack Warden. It's somewhere around here and heaven can wait. And I think right after Shampoo. Yeah. Yeah. It's somewhere mm-hmm. It's somewhere in the 76 yeah. to 79. But isn't he also, age. is he, maybe he's in Muppets Take Manhattan. He's not in the Muppet movie. So I was going to say, what else it's does he Muppets, have going on? I think it's Muppets Take Manhattan. Yeah. yeah. Tambor is on this and Three's Company and getting spun off into the Ropers at the same time. So shit's happening for him, but yeah. probably his Arrested Development slash, what was the Amazon show he was on? Transparent. Transparent. Yeah. yeah. That didn't end great. Christine he Lottie. Was he was, that's one of the great yeah. TV performances. Christine Lottie. What's her apex mode? Definitely Chicago, Chicago Hope. Hope. Chicago Hope, right? Chicago yeah. Hope. Five years as the star of Chicago Hope. What do you got for Jewess in, in the heat of the night? Apex Mountain? Moonstruck? Well. I mean, a lot had happened by then. So much. God. I think that's been his most enduring movie. Moonstruck? Like for people like my daughter's I like age. He, I feel like he, Mo- uh, Moonstruck, you mean? Yeah. 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 I think that's the one that's had the best legs. Yeah, probably. That's a pretty, that's like how Legally Blonde, some of these other movies, they just kind of keep going. But In the Heat of the Night is a movie that will like will that, never die. That's, yeah. I think that's the answer. It's a legendary movie. Yeah. Courtroom Meltdowns? It's this or Jessup? I'll rip off your head and piss on your <laughs> dead skull. You fucked with the wrong Marine. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's Courtroom Meltdowns. This is, this is pretty big. I think this is the most cited. All you did was weaken a country today, <laughs> fantasy. <laughs> I love a few good men so much. Uh, Baltimore movies, Apex Mountain. No, oh, Baltimore from, movies. I think it's Diner. Diner. I think it's Diner. Yeah. All right. Diner, okay. Tin Men. I'm trying to think of what's something more recent. More recent? Just like in the last 30 years. But not, is it, there is a, Barry, a, a non Barry Levinson Baltimore movie? Yeah, that's almost its own apex mode. I mean, uh, best racehorse name, Justice for All. Sure. Uh, I like what about that. Fleming's photos? <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Picking nits. Why didn't they show Arthur punching Fleming? Seems like just a natural scene to have in the movie. But then it starts out. It kind of. I don't know. You just you'd rather have, to, have him in jail. You'd rather year. have okay. him in jail. You just rather have him in jail. I do like when a movie doesn't feel like they have to show every single critical okay. character moment. Why weren't any black people working in Baltimore in 1979? Well, when you well, there are people all over the the courthouse. There are just no lawyers, but, which makes a kind of sense to me. And in all the movies that we've been talking about, no black lawyers. Right. I believe that. I totally believe that. Alfred Woodard, of course. I don't know if you guys got into the black judge trope. We did. We talked about we primal fear. Yeah. But we didn't fully go into the research I did on yeah. this, which was the black judges in America right now are 5.5%, but it feels like in movies, it's like 70%. Yeah. yeah it's because it's easier it's the to one give way to them, slide the party. Like they are physically present, but don't have to say anything yep. except yeah. overruled or yeah. sustained the whole time. Easy counselor. Yeah. yeah. It's that's, and you know, you get to be, you basically get to be a housekeeper, but you get to sit in the You've chair. You've been warned. You're on house. thin ice counselor. Right. In yeah. this courtroom. You, I'm the law. <laughs> y'all, y'all want some sass? Just hire a black judge. You don't have to let her do anything. But Can I see you in my private chambers, please? <laughs> presumed innocent, black judge. Yep. A few good men, black judge. Primal fear, black judge. What else? Oh, uh, there's there's like twenty of them. Um, what's the movie that we didn't no, even talk they, about? From the hip with Judd Nelson. I mean, no, it's like, it's, oh, yeah. it's it's endemic. It's at least two thirds of the Morgan movies. Morgan Freeman and Bonfire of the Vanities. Yeah. Good one. Uh, you know, I mean, there's always their way to sh- make it a pretend it's a more diverse cast. It's it is basically giving an ex- it is giving the most important job to the least important genre of actor, according to the to the hot to Hollywood. Yeah. I'm searching black judges in movies really <laughs> quick because I feel like there's some other ones we left out. This would be a great listicle. We should publish this. I mean, I here. feel like you pro- like everybody except maybe who hasn't played Denzel's never played a judge. He's played lawyers. He's played mo- lawyers multiple times, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Yeah, no judges. No, I mean, because the judge is a thankless job. Like, Morgan Freeman's not playing a judge now. He's no. playing a judge in 1990. Pretty important job, though. Uh, yes, obviously, Sean, but in the movies, it's not. Right? 
Clarence Thomas is a judge. Clarence Thomas is a justice. That's a whole other thing. Well, he was a judge, and was he not? I have one more pick in there for you guys. Be that as it may. <laughs> hey, John said, just get another lawyer. I don't like your Pacino plan that much. It's a bad I'll get plan. the guy who punched me once, and but that, I do that'll think be my strategy. It's okay. a real indictment of How about just get the best errors. lawyer? It's, a, it's an indictment of it's it. Fair, Here's an idea. Get take. the best lawyer in Baltimore and keep going. No argument. Any other pick and nits? Uh, I mean, that, I, think we, I think I've picked. I think I've picked all my notes. Sequel, prequel, prestige, TV, all black cast are untouchable. It would be a TV show today about the inner workings of the Baltimore think, court system. Could we do prestige TV? Like if, would you give it a test drive? If it was like HBO has a new show based on the 1979 movie and justice for all mm -hmm. produced by Barry Levinson, written by some up and coming screenwriter. You need it's all set the, in Baltimore. You'd, get, you'd need all the crime writers basically. To, you need yeah. like, would you watch the pilot though? I feel like I would. Oh, sure. Starring Aaron Paul as Arthur Kirkland. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> But wasn't like the night of is kind of a version of this, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's um, the modern version. Of this. It's it's it goes kind of, you know, formally. I don't really it's, they're very different things. But I mean, they produce they result in a not dissimilar um, sense of hopelessness in some way. Is this movie better with Wayne Jenkins, Danny Trejo, Catherine Hans, <laughs> Deep Buscemi, Sam Jackson, J.T. Walsh or Philip Baker Hall? It's tough because this movie came out so Before long ago. All of them. I guess it would have to be a young Philip Baker Hall, right? Mm -hmm. He's the only person old enough. Um, young Trejo. <laughs> what would like? Yeah, okay. He'd be like a teenager though. Well, I mean, do we add Pesci into this system. list just because we said Pesci's gonna? Oh, you weren't there for that. We were saying, should we just add Joe Pesci to the better list? Is this movie better with Joe Pesci? Oh, I think it's actually the opposite, where Joe Pesci only made like 14 movies. And yeah. that's, that's kind of great that he yeah. was just like, ah, I'm not really interested in working for nine years. So no movie is better with Joe Pesci. Well, he just, he, each role gets to be iconic. So you don't have to worry about thinking about yeah, him in any other role. Uh, you know, Wayne Jenkins is from Baltimore. Oh, yeah. That's, that's fair. But he would totally tip this movie over. And this is a movie that stars Al Pacino. I think the Wayne Jenkins performance is directly inspired by Al Pacino in this era. <laughs> right. For sure. I don't have any unanswerable questions. We hit everything. Well, Eve, I have, have one, which is did was Pacino always going to tip over into the mistrial? Or was it Forsyth saying to him? I think a hundred percent it was right Forsyth. before. Yeah. Yeah, I think Forsyth. I mean, so he was now, just gonna defend him. Yeah. Well, because he wasn't he wouldn't have been lying at that point. At the, at the point at which Forsyth basically says... No, but, but, but not specifically when he admits that he did it, but specifically when he says, I'd like to have another go at her, or whatever terrible, awful thing he says when he sees the woman in the court. Oh, I think... That, that felt like the moment where Pacino's character decides, like, fuck this guy. We're, we're taking oh, him down. possibly, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't... That, somewhere during that sequence, he's like, I, I can't do this. Right. I can't do this. This is undoable. What's your best double feature choice of this movie, Sean? Is it Dog Day Afternoon? Pack them. Probably, I think so. I mean, you could you could say like this would be really good with Diner or with Tin Man or oh know, yeah, one of those Baltimore, Baltimore movies. Yeah. yeah, this then Diner. I like that. I mean, you could go, you could stay in Pacino Lawyer Land and say Devil's Advocate. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I like that. That's really I mean, good. that's an option. That's really good. That might be um, happening in this podcast. You could also do a Frederick Wiseman movie like Domestic Violence, like something that leaves you in the criminal justice system you know, and a city at the same time. It would be a bold programming. I would go to that double feature. Yeah. The Indian Red Zawantne Award for what happened the next day. Um, Arthur gets disbarred? <laughs> yeah. He uh, what, and what moves, he moves to California. <laughs> He's got to leave the state. Works for his uncle's he, nursing home. He probably <laughs> goes into business for himself, right? We don't know if it'll get disbarred, right? Like, I mean, hmm. I, I don't know. It's not know. looking good for him. Comes the jam of the Clippers. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just trying to... Oh my god! More, really, more the Baltimore Bullets at that time, right? Yeah, I don't yeah. think it ends great for him. Uh, no, I don't think that's the message you're when supposed you're to get. When you're disbarred, does that mean no aspect of the legal system you can work in? Uh, I think there's there are things there are workarounds, but basically you cannot practice. Law. Can you be a professor? You can probably, yeah, yeah, you can be a professor. Oh, there, there it is. He's become some professor. That'd, I think I'd it means that. you have to spend the rest of your life reevaluating Pacino's performance in The Godfather. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
I just said it wasn't top five. That's not what you said. What did I say? Or are we sure that was a hard part and was he good? <laughs> How hard of a part was it? I Very hard. I think it's the Louis the, restaurant scene was super hard. It's I, one of the greatest pieces of art of the 20th century. It was hard. Part two is so much harder. And I then in know. the end of part just, two, he's got to go back to being young Michael again. I don't know. I I I really no, I really don't back off now. I'm, you no, back no, 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 no. I'm I'm a hundred percent with you in terms of where in like I'm not choosing this to be the great Al Pacino performance. Yeah. God You're Potter. bullying me now, but you what you can't oh, hear anyone. is every listener no, in the universe. Nobody's bullying, bullying you. you. Listen, Wait, we just speak. Why are we even truths. using a term like bully? <laughs> where did bully come from? <laughs> You're, We're just people that's talking. That's some letterbox okay, okay. shit. He's bringing in. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's bullying. I'm actually like I think that we, in the scheme of things, if we leave Pacino Land, mm -hmm. this is not a conversation worth having. It's a great piece of acting. I think the 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 you conversation, mean relatively speaking, the conversation we're having is where in where in Pacino's performance ranking. Does a person being honest with him or herself put this movie? I think or, my or thing put, with put put the Godfather. My thing with Godfather one is it's still a young actor figuring out a lot of things about who he was, both as an actor and the performance and everything. He almost gets fired from the part like two times. And by the end of it, I think he figured it out and it vaulted them, vaulted him to the point where part two happens, which I think is the best performance of the last fifty years by an actor. Hmm. I'm still still holding it. Is that a hot take? I just don't feel it is. If you, I mean, because I actually think, I mean, I'm not saying this about you, but I think that in some ways, the this is kind of like, you know, I'm not a big Raging Bull person mm -hmm. as a performer. Mm. I think that performance has done so much harm to acting. We kind of alluded to it earlier, but I mean, I think that is the single most ruinous performance Maybe of the movies. And I think Pacino's Scarface is probably number two. Oh, wow. And I just think that, that, the, those four people. You mean for people emulating. And we, yes. We what does that have to do with Pacino and The Godfather? Um, I think that there's a way in which, I'm talking about received wisdom, right? Yeah. I think there's a way in which something about the way we think about Raging Bull in Pacino's, basically um, De Niro's performance in it. I, I feel like we, we've lost the ability to sort of think about what actually is happening here relative to the other things that Nero has done, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that in Pacino's Godfather case, I think the importance and greatness of the movie has conferred a kind of automatic greatness upon the performance that does not, to me, hold up to scrutiny. I think it's got, I think it's got a, 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 like an extremely good moment. You know, obviously the assassination sequence in the restaurant. Ten stars. The first but, hour of the movie, he just gets to basically layout. Do you want me to go through scenes in which he's extraordinary yes, in The Godfather? Yes. Oh, I can do it he, right when now. When he arrives I mean, at the wedding and he explains to Kay the lay of the land amongst the families and he explains Luca Brazzi and he's the wet behind the ears kid who gets shipped off who's going to be the senator. That is one part of the character before he makes a radical transformation. Later in the film, when he wants to seek revenge and he's talking to Clemenza and you see internally the wheels spinning and him determining. That's good. That's good. Later in the Louis film, restaurant. After, Got he's two good ones. after he's taken revenge and he needs to go to Italy and he needs to experience all this pain and agony and then falling in love and then having to come back to America and then totally making the, the turn where come he has to defend to his father, tough. move his father around the hospital. The scene with the dad is great. Guys. Come on, what are Fantasy's we? Fantasy's pulling I, we're, back over, we're, we're overthinking something. You, I, I think what you're saying is true, which is that a lot of times we assume that something is great because what surrounds it is great. In the case of Al Pacino, he becomes Al Pacino because of Michael Corleone. That is what happens. Yes, and I, again, and and the and the Godfather this, becomes the Godfather because of Al Pacino. Now Marlon Brando I mean, as I well, was, and Francis I mean, Ford Coppola. There are other, of a course, lot there are of other contributors. There, right? Totally. Um. The only reason to even go down this road is to mount a defense for Injustice for All <laughs> being like one of the top. I can't believe you guys top, said that about top. James Conn. 
Oh, what he's, it, he's, 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 really he's like going for it. And I like Santino. You know, I love Santino. <laughs> iconic character. <laughs> of course, but Pinnacle of James Bond's career. Character, iconic character separate from great performance. What piece of memorabilia would you want from Injustice for All? Mm. Um, I think uh, the wig. Yep. <laughs> It's I don't good. know who kept the wig, but the suitcase I would, that he I hits the car that. with. Mm. Mm. Coach sure. Finstock award best life lesson: Don't trust the American justice system. Don't become a lawyer. Don't become a lawyer. Mm, I don't think it's. Don't, don't become think a you lawyer. can change the world as a lawyer. I think. I think. I think keep fighting. Right? Is that the message? Oh, oh my god! god. You're You're so so optimistic. I, what a guy. I don't. Wow. He's a better human than us. Seriously. Because the system still exists, right? Like and. I, I, I obviously, I mean, I don't know what obvious it is, but like, I mean, I, there are so many reasons to not trust or believe in the system, but it's mm -hmm. the only one we've got. Yep. And the more people in it who respect, understand, uphold its virtues, mm -hmm. the better the system is. Right. This is a person who understands this. And the sort of tragedy of the movie is that it flushes him out because he knows this. I mean, it's easy to sort of like accept the movie on its face value and look at this guy, you know, outside this courthouse and be like, oh, well, I guess there's nothing we can do. But I mean, you know, I don't have the luxury of being like, oh, well, I guess there's nothing we can do. Right? That, that's fair. I mean, I just feel like this and this is a also if Barry Levinson had made this movie and never gone back to Baltimore, never revisited the criminal justice system in that city. I think that. <laughs> This is a movie that is the beginning of an argument about reform, mm -hmm. right? Um, it is not the end of a conversation about, you know, the sort of lies that a movie like To Kill a Mockingbird tell us about the justice system. It's tricky, though, because a lot of Barry Levinson's movies are about going back into the past when things were easier and better. Well, you know? welcome to white Hollywood, yeah, Sean. You know, he doesn't really. I mean. Who won the movie, Al Pacino? Yes. Yes. Isaiah, what'd you think? Uh, it's an interesting movie. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, how the story is told feels a little bit disjointing, to be honest. Okay. Uh, it was probably my biggest nitpick. Like, there's really great scenes in it, but I just feel like they touch on a lot of things, but don't wrap up almost anything. Interesting. Whatever, That's, whatever happened to um, Warden's character who was suicidal? Exactly. There That's like some, somebody I wondered. Like we see him last with a gun in his mouth, and then nothing. And we forgot yeah. to mention Jeffrey Tambor tipping his, his wig, wig. Yeah, was like one of the most famous shots of the movie. Yeah, we didn't mention that till the podcast right now. I mean, I don't know. I think that this is one of this is this is a style of movie I love, Me which too. is that nothing really gets like resolved, um, because you know that the questions it's raising are bigger than any one plot thread right and this is a generational thing though what do you mean because isaiah's generation wants answers and things to come to their conclusion and this these 70s movies a lot of them like the whole point of it was there was no conclusion it's yeah, more about the questions fucked. they're raising than <laughs> the answers what, that's what the message yeah. of the movies are but it's more leaving you with questions and fears more than actual answers like, I don't know yeah. what happens to Jack Warden's character, but I'm guessing it's probably not great. I'd assume he blows his head off. Yeah, he yeah. probably kills somebody in the courtroom at some point. Tambor definitely goes nuts. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that, like, the atmosphere is in many ways. The, like, that is the, mm. that is what the movie is actually, like, about, right? Yeah. It is the feeling, it is the despondency it's leaving the you with. The Um. You know, this isn't this is movie with a lot of story, but not a lot of plot. Um, it's about people behaving, and unless they die, <laughs> um, well, and also how there is no there is no how arbitrary it is where your lawyer shows up two minutes late, and all of a sudden now you're in jail for another year yeah, and a half. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I hear you. It is there are like seven different things happening at many different at many different times, and there are scenes where Pacino's not even in them. Mm -hmm. Right. Where, you know, he set something in motion and we see at some point Larry Brigman, you know, at lunch with this guy remembering and you as an audience member like, oh, what are you doing? Why are you at lunch? 
I forgot to mention one thing that I didn't have an answer for, for probably an answer for questions. What was that outdoor covered pool thing John Forsyth had? Have you ever seen that in your life? It was it was like a pool sauna. I've never, yeah, I, I've you know, never seen. It. I mean, I'm trying to keep the steam in the pool so that you're in a hot pool. I've never seen that in my life. <laughs> I've never seen an ad okay, for that. I'm sorry. I don't know what that was. I, I don't. It might just be as simple as this is a man with a lot of freaky deaky shit going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is another realm for him to practice some yeah. freaky deaky shit. Some sauna pool. I mean, with like I said before, there's a little bit of like. Dracula's cave, yeah. Satan's lair Definitely aspect to it. One of my rules is when you're posing during sex for photos, probably you're a freak. <laughs> How many have you posed for? <laughs> Zero. 